You know I'm right. Nick Durst here with Joe Calabrese. And Joe, today we are going to be spanning the wide world of sports. We have a six-time winner of the New York Sportscaster of the Year Award, an Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, a New York Times best-selling author, a man who has covered multiple major sporting events such as Super Bowls, World Series, and Olympics during his 50-year broadcasting career. And he is a New York State Broadcasters Hall of Famer and a National Jewish Sports Hall of Famer and a WAER Radio Hall of Famer. No, I am not giving his eulogy here, Joe. Just a proper introduction for the legend that he is, right? <laughs> it's a, uh, we're, we're having a very, very uh, accomplished guest again on with us. Uh, he's an eight-time Emmy Award winner. Uh, I really don't even think I could go any further. Uh, so we'll, we'll get, we'll hit the ground running and get started on that. Uh, he's honestly... Uh, sincerely one of our inspirations obviously you grow up in New York you watch the nightly newscast and you watch the sports uh, come in right into your tv homes a uh, very very special guy to us uh, again like I said one of the most accomplished sports casters I think uh, really in New York history we're very honored and it's a privilege to have him on Mr. Len Berman Len thank you for joining us today how are you I'm doing great I think we're out of time but I appreciate the intro uh, <laughs> hello everybody <laughs> Thanks, Len. Take care. <laughs> Len, when you, when you hear people read back your accomplishments, what, what, do, what do you think? Are you, are you proud of yourself, embarrassed, or somewhere in between? You know, I, I, think, I think it's an accomplishment that I'm proud of. For example, on Twitter over the weekend, someone posted a, uh, a clip from a newscast when I was on Channel 2 40 years ago of Mike Bossy scoring his 48th goal in 48 games or something. And I said, wow, I was young and I've been around a long time. But when you think about it, I mean, that's, it is crazy. And, you know, you, I'm sure you've heard people say this before. You wonder where the time goes. But I've really literally been broadcasting half a century, which is just mind blowing. And what's even more mind blowing is I'm doing a news talk show now. It's not even sports. So it's, uh, it's been a crazy journey, but it's, uh, you know, it's been fun. And uh, thankfully, it's still going. So let's, let's I think take your personality and all your accomplishments. There are a lot of things regarding your career that I think you were absolutely ahead of your time with. Uh, and we're, we're going to get to that very, very soon. Yeah, let's, let's take it back to the beginning here. You, like so many great broadcasters, went to Syracuse University. Right. Uh, did you know prior to going there that you wanted to pursue a career in sports broadcasting? And who was kind of your inspiration to want to pursue this path? Well, I, I, this is a, a crazy story, but I never really considered broadcasting. I went to uh, Stuyvesant High School in New York City. I had an English teacher uh, by the name of Sterling Jensen, who I later found out was one of the founders of the um, Roundabout Theater. He was an actor and he needed to make some money. So he was a teacher at Stuyvesant. And he once told me I had a terrific voice and I just was stunned. He said, I, I never I never gave it any thought whatsoever. Um and he said, we have to work on getting your voice out of your diaphragm into your mouth. <laughs> You'd be an actor. And I, and I knew right then and there I wasn't going to be an actor. I just had zero interest. So I kind of had a thought that maybe I, you know, I liked radio as a kid. I would listen all the time. But it, was always, it wasn't always sports. But it, I, I was listening to a lot of different things on radio. And I got to Syracuse. And I walked into the college radio station. WAER, which you mentioned before, and I was now blessed by being in her Hall of Fame. And uh, I knocked on the door and they weren't even open. You know, <laughs> I had to come back the next, you know, they haven't even opened for the year. And I walked in there and said, I want to, you know, I want to be a disc jockey. You know, where do I try out? And they said, well, everyone wants to be a disc jockey. I said, they said, uh, uh, can you read the scores? We need someone to read the scores on Saturday night. I swear to God, this is what happened. And I said, I stopped dead in my tracks and said, I could do that. I mean, I thought, you know, to be on the radio, well, first, uh, when I was watching the sports news in New York growing up, the people who did the sports news on the local channels, two, four, and seven, were all former football giants. It was Frank Gifford and Pat Summerall and Kyle Root. I said, well, I figured you had to be a former athlete or you had to really be a genius, which I laugh about now because any idiot could be on the air, as we've all found out, including yes. me. So, um, so I read the scores and that. That's, Hand to God, that's how it began. I was reading the scores. I said, yeah, I don't have a date Saturday night. Sure, I'd be happy to read the scores. And that's how I kind of fell into sports. Yeah, and while you're, while you're there at the University of Syracuse, you had Floyd Little and Tom yes. Coughlin playing for the football team. What are your memories uh, like of going up some football games? 
Well, I have no memory of Coughlin at all. In fact, I, uh, several years ago, I brought him the, our uh, Syracuse yearbook because we're on like the next page. I'm B, he's C. And we had a little, <laughs> little laugh over that. He didn't remember me from college. I didn't remember him. But Floyd Little was my fraternity brother. He just passed uh, from cancer. And my memory is very first game as a freshman uh, for me, Floyd wasn't allowed to play until his sophomore year because they didn't let freshmen play uh, college football back then. You had to play JV. Very first game he plays, he's up against Kansas. And Kansas has a running back, Gale Sayers. And I'm sitting there at the stands and Floyd Little scores five <laughs> touchdowns. <laughs> and, and before the year is out, he turns out to be my fraternity brother at uh, Toy Delta Phi. And we've had a nice uh, war. And everyone loved Floyd. Just a magnanimous smile. And turned out to be a great running back. Cute story about Floyd is he winds up in Denver primarily because the sports information director at Syracuse, a guy by the name of Val Pinchbeck, who later worked for the NFL, went to get a job in Denver. And the day he was drafted, I ran into Floyd. I, I swear to God, he says to me, Val knows I don't want to go to Denver. And uh, <laughs> it turned out great for him. He had a, had a great life, great career, Hall of Fame, businesses. It worked out terrific. But, you know, the first game I ever announced in college was a basketball game. And the guy who played in that game was Jim Beheim. I have a tape somewhere and he was, yeah. he was a hell of a player. I mean, he looked, he doesn't look like a, an athlete, but he was, he was a heck of a player. He teamed with a guy named Dave Bing and that, that was a pretty good team uh, back in the day. Yeah. I think, I think Beheim was Coughlin's uh, dorm resident manager or, or was he? something. Yeah. I remember, I think I, I think I saw that once. Well, so. my claim to fame is I was a resident advisor uh, in graduate school and a guy on my floor who was a freshman was named David Falk. Have you heard of him? Well, he was uh, Michael Jordan's agent and, ah, uh, and very Pat, very Ewing's man. agent. Yep. And there's now a Falk School of Sports Management at How Syracuse University. So my yeah. claim to fame is I was I was his resident advisor. That's incredible. Uh, so Syracuse University, we've had many Syracuse alums yeah. on our, our show for the last couple of weeks. Uh, obviously, there's a rich history yeah. of broadcasters and sports personalities who have gone to Syracuse. Uh, can you name some that you got to share some time with uh, and, and some that you uh, continue to, to have connections with or had connections with after you left the school? Well, that's one of my favorite questions when I speak to alumni groups is uh, why there are so many sportscasters who came out of Syracuse. And I always tell them it's a very simple answer. Uh, none of us could get into Cornell. And uh, it always <laughs> Syracuse alumni can relate to that. Uh, hey, we got a president. You know, this is the first time a Syracuse alum, uh, Joe Biden, went to Syracuse uh, uh, Law School. So, congratulations. Hail to the orange and Joe Biden. Hey, um, uh, Marty Glickman was special. Uh, when I was a sophomore at Syracuse, I decided I'm going to have a sportscasting conference. And I invited college sportscasters from around the Northeast. And I had two guests who came as speakers. Uh, Marty Glickman and a guy just starting out in the business named Marv Albert. And they both came for a, uh, an American Airlines ticket, which I think was 12 bucks. Wow. And, uh, and, and Marv, well, let me go back to Marty first, then I'll get to Marv. Uh, Marty was, uh, uh, I'll remember the speech he gave at that conference to this day. Uh, he got up there and said, here's the key to being a sportscaster. One, do your homework. And I was like, well, now it makes sense, but you know, it's you know, know what you're talking about. Uh, and then he said, uh, speak English. And I, and I always wondered, what do you mean by that? He said, very simple. You never walk into a locker room and hear a football player say, Oh, look at me. I'm toting my pigskin to pay dirt. And, you know, use word, you know, so I carry the ball, you know, that's, so I never in my career used the cliche. It got to the point where, um, I never said the uh, nightcap of a double. I'm just, I just never, never used the cliche. I, I used to have arguments with my people in, in, in the sports department. I said, uh, why do you say there were, uh, he had a solo home run? I said, every home run is a solo home run, unless it's a two run homer or a three run homer or a grand slam. So we get into the semantic stuff of Marty. Uh, and then Marty wound up being a mentor of mine, he went to work at HBO. Mar Marty, if you don't know, ran in the Olympics or wanted to run in the Olympics. Yes. He wanted to run in the 36 Olympics, but they pulled him off the team because it was in Hitler's Olympics and he was Jewish and the U.S. team made up some ridiculous story and Marty got banned by the U.S. Olympic team 
because he was Jewish. I mean, that's the, what a bad story it was. Marty was a great sprinter, may have been one of the first athlete sportscasters, although Kurt Gowdy likes to take that title as well. But uh, And then Marty wound up at HBO and he wound up hiring me. I wound up doing a college football game of the week, uh, sorry, college basketball game of the week on HBO with Tommy Heinsohn, also, also just recently passed. And our very first game we did was a college kid from Michigan State, uh, Magic Johnson. And then we did a college game with a guy at Indiana State. We went to uh, uh, Terre Haute, and that was Larry Bird. And we did a game of the week, and, and that was a year before ESPN came into existence. So Marty was ahead of his time with HBO. And the Glickman, was, what's that? The Glickman HBO documentary was was really oh, yeah. incredible. One of the best documentaries I've okay. seen. So I don't have to tell you all about Marty. But now Marv uh, was always extremely kind to me. Uh, uh, you know, I would write him notes and I, I would actually go up to the studio. He was working at WHN radio doing a, a pre and post game uh, Mets show. This is before he even got the uh, I remember him telling me that he was going to do some Ranger and games that are going to be out there. They weren't going to carry the whole game. They were going to carry the last two minutes of the first period. The last two minutes. Of, can you imagine a Rangers not being on a radio. So they're going to do the last two minutes of the first uh, last two minutes of the second and the whole third period. And I remember saying to Marv, Wow, that's cool. You're going to get to go to the forum in Montreal. <laughs> so, and uh, but he was always very. And I asked him later on. He said, "Why? You know, a lot of people would write to him or call him or ask him to listen to tapes." And he, he just he was very complimentary. He said, "I just thought that you had something." And I, and I you know, so he was nice to me. But I invited those two. Now um, I worked with Costas at NBC. I replaced Dick Stockton in Boston on WBZ. He had been doing the Celtic games and the local news in Boston. I replaced him. In fact, I replaced him. This is a little known credit that you never give me. I lasted two weeks or three on NHL 79, which was the uh, uh, syndicated National Hockey League game of the week. Uh, they fired me, I think, after three weeks. The guys the guys who ran the show in Canada didn't, uh, didn't think I fit there whatever they were looking for. So anyway, but I replaced Stockton on that as well. So anyway, Stockton left. I was happy. I, I picked up his crumbs. Uh, who, uh, I don't, you know, I just, I, I've, I've known them all. I mean, I think Ian Eagle does a terrific job and uh, Sean McDonough and Mike Tirico. I mean, the Syracuse uh, lineage, I, I know I'm leaving something out and I, someone out and I apologize because, uh, uh, but I really did not go there because of Marty or Marv. Marty, uh, Marv did go there because of Marty. And Costas did go there because of uh, uh, Marv and Marty. And uh, I just never, I, you know, I, I just wound up. I went to major in engineering. I, I took some aptitude tests and they said I should be an engineer because I had an introverted personality and I was good at math. And I said, this, that didn't work. <laughs> Trust me, I, I, I didn't last very long. And I love doing the radio stuff. And that's what I gravitated towards. I think it's better you did this. <laughs> no doubt about it. So what, when you when you come out of college, did, was your first job on air the HBO sports? No, game? oh no, this is a, that was several years later. Uh, I sent out letters at the time uh, and resumes to f uh, the top fifty markets, and each station had a CBS, NBC, and ABC. So I sent a hundred and fifty letters, and um, I got I actually got a response for an interview of all places, Channel Two of New York. Wow! I went in for an interview and they wow. and they said. Uh, uh, you know, go to Minnesota somewhere and work there for a few years and come back. I said, I'd, I'd love to go. No one would offer me a job in Minneapolis. Um, I had won an internship to be a news intern in Dayton, Ohio, of all places. And they brought me back full time as a news reporter slash anchorman. And that's how I started in Dayton, Ohio for three and a half years. And uh, I would sneak away and try to do a sports story whenever I, I actually wound up covering the 1972 World Series with the A's and uh, the Reds because uh, the main sports guy was off doing a Miami University football game and I got to go. And I'm down on the field. I'm interviewing Sparky Anderson on the field after the game from the local station in Dayton. I mean, times were very different back then. You could actually get access to people before all you guys with your podcasts and your ESPNs came around and screwed it up for everybody. But uh, uh, so I was in Dayton, Ohio for three and a half years. And I, kept, I, and I kept find, trying to find a job. This is a, you're going to love this story. It's so typical broadcast. So I, I get a, a job interview in Boston, of all places. At that time, you would look up. There was a magazine, broadcasting magazine, with blind box office numbers. And you'd send your tape off. I didn't know where it was going. I went to Boston. They brought me in for an audition. And they said, ah, we're going to bring it back. It's between you and another guy. 
we're going to bring you uh, in for a second audition. This is Boston. Boston, my God, I'm trying to get out of Dayton. This is Boston. And, um, and they called me up and I said, well, uh, we gave the job to the other guy. And I was crushed. I said, I'm never, I'm never getting out of Dayton. And then a week later, they called back and said, you know, the guy, his wife is pregnant, doesn't want to leave Peoria. So you get the job. Whoa! I mean, so I, <laughs> and a year later, I'm doing Celtic games with Bob Cousy. So that, you talk about a crazy, crazy bit. Oh, let me tell you, this is another funny story. So this, this is all part of the timeline. So I'm in Boston five years. I created something called Sports Fantasy, where people could write into me, and uh, I would carry out their fantasies. They they wanted a stand in goal against Wayne Gretzky, or they wanted the. It was a wheelchair kid, a teenager in Chicago. We had him playing a wheelchair game against Michael Jordan, who's also in a wheelchair. We had some great moments, um, which I eventually brought to NBC uh, Sports World. But so now I apply for a job in New York City, and I have a real good in because the guy who's the news director. Uh, there's an opening for a six o'clock sportscaster. At that time, they broke up the six and the 11. The six o'clock guy was Steve Albert. He left to do Mets games. The 11 o'clock guy was Jim Bowden, another guy who passed away. I mean, my God, unbelievable. Um, so there's an opening at six o'clock. And the guy, the news director, is a former Boston news director who saw my work in Boston. I said, oh, this is going to be great. And it comes down to me and one other guy. <laughs> and, and they give the job to the other guy, who's Sal Marciano. Oh, and uh, they said, well, he, he's, be he's better known in New York, but well, you know, we think you got a little something. We'll put you on the weekends. Okay. So what happens is a year later, channel two hires Warner Wolf from channel seven at the unheard of price of $400,000 and Sal is out, but I'm doing the weekends. So I stay. I mean, it's just, uh, that shows you how crazy the entire business is. And I was at channel two and then I, they brought me over to NBC in 1982, where I was there forever. So, what was the audition process like for each of these different places? Was it all similar back then? Would you they fly you in and then you you come on set and do a do a taped audition? Boston was the only place that did that. Uh, after that, it was just they looked at a tape, and I used to say for the longest time is I never sent a resume to anybody. I mean, it was like after Boston, I never ha even had a resume, and so at that by that time you have agents. And an agent sent over, in fact, two guys claimed to be my agent. They both sent tapes over to Channel 2. And that's how I got to Channel 2. Uh, and, and they just met with the honchos at NBC. And they knew me. And I was also, um, they call, and it shows you crazy business. They called me about two shows that, that I wound up doing that showed up on ESPN. One was the original Sports Reporter show. Remember that show that lasted four years? Sunday I was the morning. original host. I, for a couple of years, and I would do that show. And I was also the voice of the first television voice of the Big East Conference. And uh, in those days, you had uh, Patrick Ewing and Chris Mullen and those guys four years. And uh, th that's when college basketball was at its best. And uh, so I was doing all those things. So I was very visible. People knew who I was, and and they gave me a shot. And that's how uh, that's how stuff happened. But the only place they actually flew me in twice that was Boston. That was that was crushing. When they call you up and say you don't got the job. Uh, man. I mean, oh, there was another job. When I was in Dayton, I, they brought me down to Cincinnati for, which was just 45 minutes away. There was a weekend sports job. And when I didn't get that job, I said, I'm never going anywhere in this business. And I, and I had literally, I'm telling you, I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I, 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 I didn't know anything else. I'm so happy you mentioned being the voice of the Big East Conference because Nick is a, a graduate of St. John's. I went to Maris. I graduated from Maris. So we both did similar things there. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to, to ask you about your time doing play-by-play -play stuff in Boston with Bob Cousy because you kind of glossed over that. Bob Cousy, absolute legend, one of five, five, ten greatest guards of all time. Uh, but you got to do play-by-play -play during your time in Boston. You were right. the voice of Big East basketball. Right. At, at this time, you're doing play-by-play, -play, which is very different than what you ultimately end up doing on right. you know, the, new, the newscast. So when you started doing that, Naturally, was there something in your mind that said, maybe this is what, you know, I'm destined to do? Did that career path or expanding on that ever consider, was that ever a consideration in your mind? Because, you know, you mentioned the great Marv Albert. We had Kenny Albert on our show a couple of weeks ago, and he got to tell us some great stories about his father. Uh, Marv Albert, one of the greatest play-by-play -play guys of all time, uh, somebody that you know very well. Uh, did that thought ever cross your mind? Uh, were you praise during your time doing that? Is that something that you enjoyed doing? And what are the differences? What were the main differences for you doing play-by-play -play 
as opposed to what you were doing, preparing, doing nightly news stuff? Well, you asked about eight questions there, uh, which is sorry, why you get the big bucks, there. Joe. Uh, okay, Kenny Albert, I've known since he was a little boy, because I actually, uh, when I moved to New York, I wound up living in the same town as, as Marv and his family at the time. Marv has since left, but uh, I've known Kenny since he was a kid. He used to follow his dad around doing stats. And he said, <laughs> who's the kid this creepy kid? Out of? Very nice boy. By the way, Marv has the nicest, nicest kids. Kenny has uh, uh, two brothers and a sister and uh, the family. I'm sorry, two sisters and a brother and uh, the nicest kids you'll ever meet. Uh, the difference between the play-by-play thing. Well, I grew up as a, as a Yankee fan as a kid. And I would think from time to time, do I want to do baseball games? Uh, Mel Allen was one of my heroes too. And, um, but the thought of, I, I didn't love traveling them. And the thought of going three nights to Chicago and three nights to Kansas City and three nights to Milwaukee, it really didn't sound appealing. I know it sounds great to any young broadcaster to be a, a voice of a baseball team. What I really, really pictured myself as, this, this is where I took the career path, I fancied myself more as a producer than an, as an announcer. So when I would do the local sports news in Boston, then in New York, I was more into the production. I, if I didn't appear on camera, that was great. You know, if I had this video and that slide or that thing or that piece of material, I was more interested in the material. And I think, you know, uh, Marty Glippen used to tell people that, that he thought I could have, uh, have made a good uh, sports producer. And I think that was the ultimate compliment because, um, just to uh, announce scores or just to announce games, really, believe it or not, now I called some great Big East games and called some great Celtic games. It just, you know, the game ended, you went home and it was done. Uh, the better memories was the fact that we'd fly into Logan Airport and Paul Silas or John Havlicek would give me a ride home. I mean, it was just very different times, just very different. And you really were part of a family. And I enjoyed that aspect. But I think the production aspects led me more into um, the sports fantasy thing I mentioned before, doing the local newscast, and also uh, I did this thing called Spanning the World, which you referenced. It was just a pro the production elements I, I found very fulfilling. So I think that's what led me more down my career path than the play-by-play. -play. Although I love them. Listen, when we, we would do the guard, you know, the Big East Conference came to Madison Square Garden. We would do four games in one day. It was exhilarating. I worked with Bill Raftery. At first, I worked with the late Dave Gavitt, who was the commissioner, and then I worked with Raftery, which was a ton of fun. And you mentioned Kuzi. I just want to say one thing about Bob, and I call or try to call him every year on his birthday. He's doing great he's 90 and uh um he uh taught me a lot about life because he was a people don't realize what a super super duper do you know before there was dr j before there was michael jordan there was dr j before there was dr j there was bob Cousy, and uh he taught me about life and he was just a good guy uh in, in dealing with uh, people who came up to him and tommy heinsen was another one I, I i never forget the night we did the larry bird game in terra haute we're in a bar after the game and some drunken fan came up to him and asked him, what do you think of Bird now, or Mr. Celtic, or whatever. And Tommy treated that, that guy as if he was a writer for the New York Times. So I, I, I really always want to credit uh, guys like Kuzi and Heinsohn for teaching you how to be a person as much as about sports and being a broadcaster. So you spent most of your life in New York City. You went to school in Syracuse. You worked in Ohio. You worked in Boston. Which place had the worst winters? Oh, well, Syracuse. <laughs> uh, come on. I mean, Syracuse, I mean, the sun didn't <laughs> shine from October to April. Um, now, I mentioned on Twitter the other day because they brought up the anniversary of the, the uh, Giants playing in Green Bay. That was the coldest. You remember the Coughlin red face? Yes. Coldest I've ever been in my life. But literally, there was one day walking across the Syracuse campus where it was so cold I couldn't breathe. I mean, I literally <laughs> could not inhale. It was just so freaking cold. Now, Syracuse was the worst. And uh, you didn't real, I didn't realize Boston was significantly a little worse than New York. I mean, and uh, as further you go south. But uh, now Syracuse wins. The, the, and I don't know how I don't know how Beheim got kids from uh, Los Angeles to come play there. They, he must have recruited them in the middle of summer. Because if those <laughs> kids had any clue what the Syracuse winner was like, they would have they never come. Len, I always wanted to know, how come in the NFL, in college too, you always see the training camps. It's 100 degrees. The guys are wearing long sleeves. Then it's game day in the middle of winter. It's one degrees. They have no sleeves on. What, what, what's know. going on there? 
uh, macho thing. It's like you guys, you know, you guys are just wearing shirt sleeves. It's a cold day out there, you know. No, I, don't. <laughs> I got rolled up a little bit, but no, I, I, you know, I guess that's a macho thing. But uh, you know, when I when I went to Syracuse, they played outdoors, and uh, I mean, this just give you that. I remember, I mean, UCLA came into play. Oh, I think there was a guy named Zeno, Gary Zeno. I forget the quarterback's name. Anyway, uh, the snowflakes in October coming. Down. I said, man, what a home field advantage this is! But you would sit on a cement. Oof. The old Archbold Stadium, we sat on cement, and it was it was miserable. And then, of course, the dome came in, and that was great. Yeah, Carrier Dome looks like a like a great a great place, and they, they do a good job there. Now, you talked about it briefly. You joined NBC when you when you first started there. You know, that's it. You're, you're in the top market now. Did you ever think you'd be there for as long as you were? And what did you, and what differences really happened for you? you know, in, in the early years there that you were able to make yourself a fixture on the network? Well, it's, it's a strange thing. Even though I grew up in New York and was working in Boston, I never had this burning desire to work in New York. And then it just started to, uh, there was a blackout. There was a famous blackout uh, uh, along the East Coast. And I remember actually writing a letter to my senator, who was Teddy Kennedy. I got a form letter back, but it bothered me that there was a blackout in New York City, and yet Boston lost the wire services, the network service. I said, oh, what the hell's going on here? You know, Because at the time, everything was based in New York. You had the three networks, you had the wire services, uh, you had Newsweek and Time a Magazine, which were big deals. Everything was new. First thing that was not based in New York is when the uh, CNN started up in Atlanta. So I realized, listen, you gotta get to where the action is, and it was New York. Now, when I first went to NBC, I was hosting the pregame show. I replaced Brian Gumbel. And I did NFL 82 and NFL 83. And then Bob Costas replaced me. And what happened was uh, Marv was doing the local sports news. And I just started filling in for Marv. And that's how that uh, happened. And then I just, listen, I mean, I just, I stayed there. You know, they didn't kick me out. I stayed there. What the difference was then and now, and I referenced it before, is you went to the U.S. Open uh, tennis and you could walk up and interview McEnroe. And then if you Connors and Martina and Chrissy, it's just, it was a different world. It was just, it was, it was a joy to cover and it was a lot easier to cover. And um, I remember standing at spring training and Reggie Jackson standing next to me in Fort Lauderdale and Re Reggie was, what a trip he was, but it was, what his act was, he looked at me and said, you're Len Berman, right? And I'm, you know, I'm flattered. I mean, I, you know, I just started <laughs> in New York. And this is, but Reggie would do that to everybody. Remember Al Roker telling me the story? He said, oh, you're Al Roker, right? I mean, it was just Reggie's way of putting you. I'm Reggie Jackson and you're not. But uh, it was very different covering. You know, when I got to New York, it was like the whole story was uh, Reggie Jackson, Billy Martin, and George Steinbrenner. And I could get Steinbrenner on the phone. It was like unbelievable. He would, and, and, you know, this is right before ESPN. I mean, once ESPN came in, they screwed it up for everybody. And they, you know, we, we, were, <laughs> we were kind of important on the local sports news for a while. Right. You guys were superstars in your own right. Uh, tell us about covering. Uh, so you mentioned the U.S. Open. Obviously, that's one of the pinnacle sports events here in the New York right. area. Talk to us about covering other stuff. We mentioned the World Series. We mentioned the Super Bowl. Uh, what was it like covering those special events? And what are some of the events that you got to cover throughout the course of your multiple decade career here in New York that are some of your favorites? Well, you just you got to mention 1994. I mean, uh, June 14th, 1994, the Rangers win the Stanley Cup. And I remember the year before, Montreal won the Cup and they rioted in Montreal. Now, here, Montreal won 1,000 Stanley Cups and they rioted and broke windows on St. Catherine Street. And they said, oh, when the, when the, when the big bad New York, wait. There wasn't a single arrest that night. It was one of the, that to me was the pinnacle. I mean, all the, you know, I covered, there were four Islanders. There were a couple of Devils championships. There was a range of everything. There were Yankees, Mets, uh, a couple of Super Bowls with the Giants. But the, the, my favorite number one moment was June 14th, 1994, the Rangers after all those years. Because I went as a kid. I mean, uh, when I, I had a friend of mine, a friend of mine liked hockey. And he dragged me to the old garden on 8th Avenue. And they had something called a geo card. And for 50 cents, you could get into any Nick or Ranger game. Now, the only drawback was you went up to the second balcony of the old garden. And if you weren't in the first two rows, you couldn't see the whole ice. You had to lean up, you had to be leaning over the ice. And uh, and I liked hockey because there were two half times. 
So we get two ice creams. You know, basketball there's only one halftime. You know, but hockey, you had two halftimes. And so I kind of was a little partial towards the hockey uh, over the years and the Rangers. I even, here's a memory, uh, the weekend of Kennedy's assassination, you know, the NFL played and Pete Rosell said it was his greatest regret that he played football on that Sunday. Well, that Sunday, there was a Ranger game at night, which I went to with my friend. I remember that. And I remember people, you know, like who won the Giant? And they, they couldn't watch the Giant game. And it, it wasn't on TV or anything because of all the, the okay. coverage of the Kennedy assassination. So I had this this memory about hockey that was special. That's why June 4th. But yeah, I have to remember the Knicks led Houston in 94, three games to two. He nearly had a double championship. That'd and then great. The, I have to tell you, OJ Simpson yeah, ruined it. Yeah, right. The OJ thing happened. Oh, I can tell you OJ stories. Oh, let me tell you an OJ story. You know, I digress. I mean, you can't, but, uh, can't talk about one without the other. They, no. they honestly hand in hand. You know. Yeah, the chase in Game Five, uh, and I remember Ahmad Rashad was covering the game for NBC. OJ's so-called suicide letter mentioned Ahmad Rashad, and I couldn't get him over. My he wouldn't come over to talk to us. I guess he didn't want to discuss. But uh, but the and the Knicks are up three games to do go down to Houston, lose both those games. John Starks is still shooting air balls to this day. Uh, OJ here t- shows you never ask me what I think if I if I'm a good judge of character. So uh, to cover spring training in Florida, I would ensconce my family at the Boca Beach Club on the water. And I would run over to do the Yankees in Fort Lauderdale before they moved to Tampa and up the coast to Port St. Lucie to do the Mets. And I'd go back and see my family in between. Well, one day uh, we would rent a cabana on the beach. And one day in the next cabana is uh, OJ and Nicole. Wow. And uh, this is, uh, uh, so, so I knew OJ over the years, greatest, the best, the best at dealing with the media, the best at dealing with the public. So I'm standing there talking to OJ Simpson for half an hour on the beach that day. And kids are coming up asking for his autograph. Kids are taking his picture. And, and I turned to my teenage son who was with us. I said, if you ever get to be in the public eye, this is how you behave. And um, I say, it's February, March. Four months later, he killed two people. And Nicole was there and had a conversation. It was the first time I ever met Nicole. And I, I, to this day, I have no idea what we talked about for about 30 seconds. I wish I knew, but uh, so I'm a bad judge. And I thought Jason Williams on the Nets was the greatest guy in the world too. And, uh, you know, he wound up blowing away his limo driver. So I guess I'm not such a good judge of character, even though I've been in this game for a long time in sports. It happens. Life happens. happens. You, know, you, can't, you really can't tell, you know, you never no, know. I, I you never know. Uh, so let's, let's bring it back. Lighter note. Uh, I want to talk to you about spanning the world. Because I mentioned at the top, I believe you are, you were ahead of your time with this. And I still think you're ahead of your time. Because I think the, the comedy bits and all the side bits are, are stuff that has now enhanced uh, sports coverage, especially in the world of, of social media that Nick and I live in. And uh, everything is a short clip. Everything is uh, a short, you know, comedy act, meme, whatever you want to call it. Right. Uh, whose idea was that? Was that your idea? Was that somebody at NBC's idea? Uh, what was the original okay. uh, basis uh, for the concept uh, and how did it end up turning into something with, with what it eventually turned into, which is, I think, one of the, the greatest you know, segments uh, of any type of newscast broadcast you know, in history? Well, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to claim to be the original blooper guy because Joe Garagiola would go on The Tonight Show and Johnny would be hysterical and, and Joe would bring on bloopers on his show. Uh, before I was on uh, Channel 4, Marv Albert did his monthly, what he called the Albert Achievement Awards, and he became a regular doing that on Letterman. And it was a guy in Washington, George Michael, at a sports machine program, and he would do his. So the idea of, of, of monthly highlights is not original. It's a great time killer. I mean, when you have a slow news day, Nothing fills up a slow news day like three minutes of bloopers. What I decided to do is I just didn't want to do straight bloopers. I didn't think a guy gotten hit in the nuts by a baseball was funny. I mean, see, you're laughing, but obviously it appeals to your sense of humor. Or, or maybe Jose can't say go get hit in the head. With the well, wall. that to me was, well, that was a good one. It went yeah. off his head over the wall. And they, everyone said it's the first time Conseco ever used to said on the baseball field. So, no, to me. It had to be a bit where it had a, a moment where you could put a piece of script to it, to turn it, you know, uh, and that's, that to me is what made it. I mean, one of the funniest clips ever for me was the horse that got bar mitzvah. Now, it doesn't sound like much of a sports clip. And believe me, 
I've been to a lot of bar mitzvahs on Long Island. It wasn't much of a bar mitzvah, but the horse turned 13. The lady in upstate New York read a few prayers, put a prayer shawl on, and called it the horse that got bar mitzvah. So I once played that clip at a speaking engagement in Boca Raton, and there was a rabbi there. So I was a little bit uh, you know, squeamish. You know, was that sacrilegious? And the rabbi said, no, no, no. There's nothing in the liturgy that says you can't have rights for animals. And then the rabbi said, you know, it really wasn't much of our bar mitzvah. And I said, of course not. He says, and the rabbi said, it must have been one hell of a bris. And uh, <laughs> to me, those are the moments that stand that. Now, I wound up doing the, the Spanning the World on Today's show for a quarter of a century. And I, and I wound up one of my career highlights. I wound up uh, going on a Tonight Show with Jay Leno once. So, I mean, uh, no, I'm not going to claim originality. What I tried to do was just make it a little bit more than a guy getting hit on the head or in the nuts. I, I tried to avoid those clips and tried to bring, I mean, this sounds like a ridiculous conversation, but I tried to bring sports bloopers up a notch. You know, I tried to raise the bar from the gutter to the curb, you know? So that's what I tried to try to do. So when you started as, as a newscaster or a sportscaster, really the only way people were getting their sports news from the same day yep. would be from you. So now yes. we fast forward to, to this, to these days, and by the time that the 11.30 news comes on, you're, or 11 yep. o'clock news comes on, you're the last person given the news. So Correct. I, my question is, do you think it would be so much harder for you today in, in 2021 to do, a, to do a sportscast? Or do you think there would have been a way you would have been able to adapt, go maybe the comedy route uh, and do things a little differently? Well, I did adapt. Uh, that's where the production came in. Listen, when I got on the air uh, in New York, when I was first doing on Channel 4, the 11 o'clock, we'd often repeat the, the highlights at 6 the next night because a lot of people hadn't seen them. Uh, you know, WCBS did not do the uh, 50, and WINS didn't do the every 15 minutes. There was no sports during the day. They would do morning drive, afternoon drive. They wouldn't do during the day. Uh, there was no ESPN and no cable. So when we were on, uh, the next night at six, you know, I'd say, well, Bill, why didn't Billy Martin bunt? I mean, I, that was like fresh. That was new the next night at six. Well, that, as you perfectly articulated, you get on at 11 o'clock at night and everyone's seen everything. So I think that's where the production of you say you don't show hits, runs and errors. You pick a moment. That's where Warner Wolf was a master at picking something just so absurd from the game that didn't matter if you saw the game, you might've missed this moment and, and it was entertaining. And I think that's that's what you had to do. And I think my production abilities and my and my ability to put, you know, add some perspective or add some history or add something to it, that's what you do rather than just giving the score. It's more than just the score. What was it like doing the NFL pregame show? Did you have access to every game? Yeah, that was, that was, a, bit, that was a lot of fun because you had all the games and you had kids watching them and, it, that was a lot of fun. And you break in with the highlights and the updates. That was a fun show. Um, what, the, what the difficult part of the show was doing a half hour pregame. And I don't think they've still figured out how to do it, where it's going to be must watch TV. And this is this is 40 years later. Um, but we would be on and uh, we were up against the CBS uh, juggernaut of the NFL today with Brett Musburger and Irv Cross and Phyllis George. And we were trying to find our footing. And we did OK. I mean, uh, the you know, I remember the executive at the time said two things were going to happen. You're going to get lousy press and you're going to get bad ratings following uh, Brian Gumbel. And neither happened. So I was kind of proud of the couple of years we have. But it was a fun gig. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, you get to host the Super Bowl. But that was at Super Bowl 17. That's that's ages ago. Now, you leave the the television business there. You, you part yeah. from NBC. And, you know, a number of years later, you get back to your roots. You go, you go into radio, you get the job with WR. At the time, 2015, the Mets go to the World Series. The team yeah. was on the network. So you're still doing lots of sports. So first, how did that opportunity come about? And then what was that first season like there, You know, the first year there like for you with the, with the Mets going to the World Series? Well, I, you know, I had no aspirations to be a news talk show host. Uh, you think sports fans are nuts? Try dealing with uh, – either Trump supporters or Trump haters. I mean, they, they are certifiable and, and uh, they're crazy. And uh, you have to give opinions. You know, when you're doing this, you know, you're doing a sports news on television. All right, so they, they give the Heisman Trophy to too many quarterbacks. Well, there's a great opinion for you. I mean, it's, it's not that much you're gonna talk about, but you get to talk radio, you gotta, you gotta be in there fighting. 
Uh, so I'm on a very conservative radio station uh, that has Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity, and I lean left. So I'm a big fan favorite on that radio station. Oh, they kill me. They call me idiot. They call me moron. And I'm still trying to get a ruling. When I graduated, from, do you graduate from idiot to moron on the scale, or do you go from moron to idiot? I mean, which is <laughs> which is the higher? Kind of the same tier. They're, they're both the same. Huh? I don't, I'm still trying to figure that one out. But no, the uh, uh, it, I have been out of broadcast. I've been home for about what five years. I was putting out a daily newsletter. I put out my top five sports store. I had a little subscription. No, people didn't pay. So I, I really wasn't making much money. Uh, I wrote a bunch of books that made some money. And uh, so I really, I had two things going. I was either going to do a, a, a weekly sports show on PBS of all places, which I thought was really going to happen. And it never happened. And out of the blue, this guy calls me from WOR and said, you know, I used to listen to you in Boston and I used to see you on live at five. And I think you can talk about more than just sports. And so I give this guy, Tom Cuddy, all the credit. He's still the program director, WOR, and he brought me in there. And, uh, and I'm going on, uh, I've just finished up six years there, which now is my second longest gig. That's longer than I was in Boston. So it's second to NBC, more than Boston, more than Dayton, more than Channel 2. And it's been a real trip. You got to learn to have thick skin because, you know, it's not fun when people call you idiot or moron, uh, even though I think I've graduated to, to moron from idiot. But yeah. you can just don't agree with that uh, so it's been kind of fun and, and now i have a co-host in michael riedel who is a, a broadway guy and he's he, he used to write the broadway column for the post and it's two of us yell and scream at each other and then we're best of friends and uh, it's a lot of fun from that standpoint and we try to have a few laughs so we have a morning talk show and people seem to be entertained the ratings are great we're the number one new york city morning news talk show uh, we have boffo ratings on long island of all places and, and new jersey and it's uh so it's been a second uh, or third or eighth career. I don't know what it is, but I'm I'm kind of proud of what uh, what's transpired here. Do you think it's kind of ironic that now you're at the point of your career where the whole theater thing kind of came full circle, and now you're doing a successful morning show uh, with somebody who has a background doing Broadway stuff? Well, the, the real irony in all this is anytime I say something stupid or whatever, I you know what I, I say to my my staff off off my what are they gonna do fire me? I mean, I was, I was already out of work. I was, you know, I was done. If I asked you off the top of your head, how many years have I been off Channel 4? Quick, what's your answer? 13. You'd be 10 or 11. Right? That's pretty good. You know, you guys are good. Um, my last year on Channel 4 was 2009. Yeah. So it's going on a dozen years. Wow. I mean, that's, uh, you know, what made me really feel good, I was at, a, I was at an event with Brian Cashman of the Yankees, and I gave him that. This was a couple of years back, and I gave him that same question. I said, how many years have they been off Channel 4 and Brian Cash would God love him? And you know why he's good at what he does? I said, how many years have they been? And he said, too long. Oh, I love the guy. You know, so I love the guy for that. Uh, all right, so let's take you back to the moment you had that goodbye because it was a very special goodbye. Remember, Al Roker was a part of it, and I believe Brian Williams. Yeah. I don't know who. Matt Lauer. How about, that? how about that for some people? Great job yeah, right? character, Len. <laughs> you know, then, then, there I am. You know, I had Brian, uh, I had uh, Brian Williams and Matt Lauer giving me, uh, you know, oh, yeah. character references. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. Well, it, it was kind of funny because they gave me a cake the last day of the year, and yes. it just said "best wishes." It didn't say to Len. I thought they like went into the prop closet and got some leftover cake from the Johnny Carson show or something. And uh, anyway, it was. Um, Listen, we all knew it was coming. I used to joke with the guy, and he's still there. David Usher is a terrific newscaster. We used to joke every day, did your ID work today? So we, we knew there were changes. The whole thing was changing. Editing was changing. Cameramen, which everything was getting cut back. Our studio was cut back. So I, I knew it was only a matter of time before they said, hey, Len, it's been nice. And, uh, and it was, you know, it was, I, I accepted it. You know, my wife was in tears. I thought it was perfect timing. I really, I did not... I, I, no offense to the devils. I did not want to do any more devil's highlights. I had done enough. <laughs> you know, I paid at the office. Okay. Uh, so I was fine with it. And uh, I'm still fine with it to this day because it brought me to this other career path. And uh, I have no complaints. None. So uh, we'll, we'll start to wrap up soon. Uh, I wanted to ask about a couple of names. We had Scott Stanford on a couple of weeks ago. He was very, very, very entertaining. 
obviously does the NBC work and works for WWE. Nick and I are pro wrestling fans, but that's another thing. Right. Uh, I also wanted to ask about Bruce Beck because I think he's become a very, very super important uh, sports personality here in the New York area. Uh, in addition to other guys like uh, Livingston, Otis Livingston for CBS too. Uh, so those people uh, who followed you at NBC, have they come back to you for advice, uh, anything pertaining uh, stuff regarding the nightly news, how they produce their segments? Uh, actually, they haven't. So that tells you that they maybe they were glad to be And I will, I'll, I'll let you in on a secret. I have not watched the nightly news on Channel 4 since I left. Uh, so what does that tell you, huh? I, you know, I see the morning news, you know, I, I actually watch a little bit of Channel 2, but everyone on Channel 2 used to work at Channel 4. So, uh, you know, Otis Livingston used to work with me at Channel 4, and Maurice Dubois, their anchor man, was at Channel 4, uh, you know, and, but I, um, no, they have not asked me for advice, and I, which is good. I'm just glad that there's a place for those guys, because I can't tell you how many years ago news directors and general managers said, ah, we're not going to do sports on the local news. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Channel 5 doesn't do a nightly sports cast. No. Uh, I don't think they bother with it. Uh, Tina Servasio, you know, that's her weekly show. It was their show, theory that so. ESPN covered. What's that? Tina Servasio does a weekly show on Sundays for them. Okay. And I think she does yeah. some morning hits, but no, they don't do any right. nightly news. They don't do a nightly on Channel 5. And, uh, and I, I can't tell you, no offense, I don't know who does the sports on Channel 7. Uh, but I'm glad there's a place for Bruce and Otis and the others because there are so many people who said it's all going to die, ESPN. And I used to fight with the general managers and the news directors. I said, wait a second. People don't want to sit through an hour of Sports Center to get to the local sports news. People want to, if you're a New Yorker, you want to know what the New York guy is saying about your team. And you know where you'll get it in a four minute or a three minute or these days, two minute dose. And uh, you know where, what time it's coming on. So I used to fight this all the time. So I'm glad that those guys were able to succeed as well as they have, because uh, there are general managers and news directors who wanted to wipe them off. So Len, when you were going to press conferences, let's say the Yankees signed somebody or whatnot, and you know, you're know you there with Sal, Warner, Scott Clark, Russ, who gets the priority question? How do they determine the order? Who gets to ask the questions? Well, when they have the group news conferences, I used to just, I never, I rarely ever ask the question in the group things because invariably they would let you do, like the Mets would let you do one-on-one. -on -one. So they hired uh, Bobby Benet or someone, you could do a one-on-one -on -one with them. The Yankees would let you do little groups. So you would gather up in little twosomes and threesomes, you'd all alternate questions. So it was very orderly. And uh, um, I love the competition. I Now I have Warner on my radio show once a week now. Um, uh, I learned a lot from Warner. I mean, one, I would come in and I would do a basketball game and show highlights. I said, well, I got to show a, a first quarter highlight. And I'd have to show a second. And Warner had none of that nonsense. He, you know, sometimes the only highlight was the guy trying to wipe the floor and here come the players and nearly run the guy over. That would be his only highlight in the game. And I would say, oh, you could do that? I mean, so I, I, you know, I would learn, I would learn a lot from the competition, but uh, I don't think we were, uh, I think we were friendly competitors. I don't think it ever, ever got nasty. We didn't all get along great. I, I will tell you that. I mean, there were some guys in there and I'm not going to mention any names, Russ Salzberg, who I don't think really cared for me very much, but uh, by and large, you all got along fine. It seems like Russ also had a feud with Steve Summers on WFAN. So I don't know <laughs> what's going on there. Steve's a great guy, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna Absolutely. I'm gonna side with Steve, and I don't even know the details. Well, I, I, when I was an intern at WFAN, Steve always treated me well, so I guess I'll side with him also. Good. Now, last question here for me: Over all the years of, of working in, in sports broadcasting, or maybe you want to take it outside of sports now with the show you're doing, who have been your favorite players or, or coaches or just personalities to interview? Well, um, interview is different from favorite people. My favorite people were people like uh, Don Mattingly and John Havlicek, who were just class acts at all times and didn't charge for autographs and just carried themselves with incredible dignity and were just, just to, so I'm huge, huge fans of theirs. Uh, when it comes to interviews, you had to go with Reggie Jackson. Uh, he never knew which way he was going to go. He'd go hot and cold. I remember once we interviewed him for NBC Sports, and he was great, magnanimous. We ran into him the next week, and he had the manager throw us out of the dugout. He was playing for the Angels at the time. So you never knew which way Reggie was going to blow. So he was always – and Steinbrenner was the best uh, at, 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 at making news. Uh, but I'm, I'm dating myself. But I love I love Daryl Strawberry. I, first of all, I thought he had the sweetest swing in the world. He was just a good guy. 
Now this is gonna this is gonna sound totally dopey to you, but I remember sitting across. They used to let the the media sit at the courtside table at Knicks games. Daryl's in the in the money seats on the other side. Remember him waving to me. Now that doesn't sound like anything to you, but there are athletes cool. who would run into and they'd be oh chat you up in the locker room and you got into the parking lot and they they pretended they didn't know who you were. Um, so the fact that Daryl was a mensch good guy yeah and i like gooden i mean i thought gooden was a good guy too a lot of those mets with gary carter the best and keith went into broadcasting so there are a lot of good guys i, I really will say the good guys outnumbered the bad guys easily how do you feel about us are we good guys or bad guys well i you know uh, <laughs> the i think this out. interview went way too long i don't think it's i don't think it's as interesting as you guys think it is but uh, I, I appreciate the time and the form. So you guys get the good guy rating. I don't think you're idiots or morons. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, well, we, we believe that you are a good guy. And we really appreciate you doing with this with us. Thank you, Len. All right, guys. Continued success, OK? Yes. We always give our guests the last words. But you got a lot of words in. But if there's anything else you would like to share or promote, you know, the floor is all yours. We hope you have a very happy and healthy, safe new year. Uh, we hope you stay safe during this pandemic. Well, you just, your screen just froze, but uh, my final word is I can't wait to get the vaccine. So that's my final word. All right, that's gonna do it here for this edition of You Know I'm Right. For our special guest, Len Behrman, and for my coach, Joe Calabrese, I am Nick Durst, and during this episode, nobody got hurt. And this has been You Know I'm Right.